Hello, everybody. Welcome back to World Stage Reform. It's been a minute, but I'm back here with a very special guest today. This is Ward Heine. He is the creator of Dark Holler, which is on lore right now. You can watch the first two episodes, and the other episodes are in production, right, Ward? You're working hard? <laughs> yeah, yeah three, is, uh, three is almost done. Uh, we've shot everything for it, and I'm actually today, I was just putting music in and doing some last minute edits, yeah. That's awesome, man. I I have to admit, this, so this is a paranormal documentary show, right? And I have to admit that me personally, I'm not so much into those type of shows. So I was, <laughs> I was kind of going into it like, ah, you know, I don't know. We'll we'll see if I like it or not, dude. I I loved it, man. I loved it. I I was surprised, and the and it's only two episodes that have been out, right? But I was surprised at actually um, how emotional I was walking away from, like how encouraged I was walking away from them. And I got to say that my wife, my wife absolutely stays away from this type of stuff, right? She's like, no, it's too scary. It's, you know, I, there's no, I'm not going to sleep at night. There's no way I'm going to watch it. But uh, she was taking a nap on the couch while I was watching it. And she woke up you know, in the first couple of minutes of the first episode. And as that episode ended, I was like, well, you know, do you want me to go watch in another room? Do you want to, do you want me to, she goes, play the next episode. We're going to finish this. <laughs> <laughs> and she, she loved it too. She walked away feeling super encouraged. So I just, I applaud you for just the first couple of episodes and I'm looking forward to seeing the rest of the show. There's going to be five episodes total. Mm -hmm. Yep. Five episodes. And then I hope to kind of revisit with an epilogue sort of thing but yeah great yeah so if you wouldn't mind just uh quickly you know telling the audience a little bit about this project and how you ended up getting into the dark holler trail <laughs> yeah um oh, it's a it's a long story i'll try to make it as short as i can um so probably like a lot of people there's been an, a resurgence in the interest in the paranormal and the strange and just kind of everything fringe uh particularly after uh, COVID. I think everyone like being locked up and um, and just like the the failure of the official narrative in a whole host of um, in a whole host of ways has everyone kind of questioning kind of the narratives that they've held on to for their whole lives. So um, I was in that mode, and I had run into a couple of people that uh, had experienced things that. Um, it, they seemed very credible and I no longer really had the, the means to just kind of put people's experience that wasn't my experience. I didn't have like a convenient, um, that's crazy drawer to stick it in and file it away. Um, one of those people was, uh, Ray Bechet, who he's been on cultish and he's in a Nick Redfern book. Um, but he's an Anglican priest, I believe now that had some bizarre interactions with some people from the defense department. But anyway, uh, that was one of them. And then uh, I had seen this series called Hellier, which is um, about some high strangeness in Eastern Kentucky and that part of the world. And I had a friend who had planted a church in Logan, West Virginia, which is um, down there, like Southern coal fields, West Virginia. Um, about like an hour from the area that Hellier's uh, initially starts in anyway. And I had asked him if he'd seen it and he had seen it. And um, I think at the time I knew that he had read or had been posting about uh, Mike Heiser's Unseen Realm, um, which is kind of a, a fairly academic treatment on... Um, sort of trying to recover the ancient supernatural worldview of the Bible, I guess would be the, the best synopsis I could give. And I asked him if being down there, if he had ever, you know, run into anything weird or paranormal. And um, it took him a minute to get to it. Uh, but he said, um, it was like, yeah, you know, I think uh, a couple weeks ago, I believe I may have uh, uh, conducted an exorcism in a, in a baptism. And so 
I had just gotten a camera kit at the time to do freelance work with. And I drove down to West Virginia thinking I'll interview this girl. Uh, she had just gotten back from um, rehab at the time I decided to go down. And uh, I would interview her and Josh and maybe some of the people that were there at the baptism and just see, maybe make like a little short YouTube thing. And um, then we, <laughs> like after we talked to her, it became clear that she was like uh, blacked out for most of the experience and the nights bef preceding it. But her mother was not, and she had been staying at her mom's house. So we knew we had to come back and talk to her mom. And when we eventually like a month ish, I think later came back and talked to her mom, um, it opened up just this whole can of worms and interconnected stories and stuff um, that uh, just got, got pretty, pretty crazy. So, yeah. so you and your filmmaker spirit saw the opportunity and just kept running with it. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was so curious too, um, because all these things kept sort of, um, by tangents, I guess, touching on, um, other stuff from that area. Um, whether it was things that come up in, in Hellier or things from like, uh, or like Mothman Prophecies, John Keel's work from that era. Or, um, and then uh, like even lately, like in the last three to six months, I've been talking to people, a couple of different like podcast hosts from the area that um, are turning up just weird uh, connections with things that, that we were running into um, in that area and around just kind of that tri-state, um, Kentucky, Virginia, West Virginia, there's like a 70 mile circle there. But, um, anyway, yeah, that's, that's how it came to be. So, uh, let me, I want to pick your brain about this, right? Because I, I, I just don't know of a whole lot of Christians who are like gung ho about, let me go in film a series about demonic activity, right? <laughs> so I think it seems like a lot of Christians to me would be like, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know if I want to mess with that kind of stuff. I don't know. So like, how do you, um, cause I believe that this is like a really good thing that you're doing, like being a part of exposing these things and putting these things within the biblical framework. Right. So how do you, go about approaching this type of subject matter with a biblical worldview and, you know, just the Christian perspective. Let me tell you uh, a historical analogy and see if it makes sense. Yeah, let's do it. The, um, the Greek God Pan uh, is like a recurring theme throughout uh, Druidic cultures and throughout Europe. And um, it's like, uh, God of the wilderness, God of the hunt kind of thing. Uh, often he's pictured uh, as a fawn or a satyr, okay, like with a goat's head. Um, what's interesting about that is uh, satyrs and fawns actually are referenced in the Old Testament uh, as spiritual beings, I think. Um, for, insta for instance, one of those places in the translators translate it differently because I don't know, maybe they don't want to come out and say Seder or Fawn, but yeah, um, one of those places, Isaiah 34, uh, like 14 and 15, where um, God's pronouncing a condemnation, I think, on Babylon and saying that he'll make it a dwelling place for all of these uh, basically spiritual entities of the wild, uh, like an unsettled wilderness. And he names, um, it's translated like donkey centaur some places, some places it's translated different, but it's uh, basically a satyr is one of the creatures that's that's listed there. Um, if you're familiar with it, I mean, I, the day of atonement ritual that the Israelites would do, um, when they sent the goat into the wilderness, uh, we say scapegoat. And so common that, you know, that in itself has become a, a shorthand for someone that, who, upon whom blame is placed, but um, the scapegoat literally is uh, a, a goat for Azazel or Azazel, which uh, is 
um, a wilderness uh, demonic entity, okay? Uh, often pictured as this satyr or fawn. So this archetype of the satyr and the fawn has been with us down through the ages, okay? So uh, one of the ways that it's represented in European or Druidic or Celtic kind of uh, circles is by this, uh, rep, uh, this face that's either carved in trees or in stone that's surrounded by leaves. Um, we've come to refer to it as the green man, okay? So, um, and you see this all over the place, uh, the carvings of the face in the tree with the leaves around it. Um, when the Christians moved into uh, Europe and were converting the Druids and that whole business, they built their cathedrals. <coughs> um, well, one, they built their cathedrals on holy sites, like on sites that were recognized by the pagans. And um, when they went to design them, they built uh, green men into the base levels of the architecture of the cathedral, right? So depictions of God up top. And again, like, I don't know, I'm reformed, so RPW <laughs> and everything, but yeah, this is what they did. Um, green man at the bottom, at the foot, God at the top, right? So what I think, like, there's... And I've run into this even like this weekend shooting. Um, there's a mentality that says, um, don't think about it, don't talk about it, stay away from anything related to pagan spirituality. And that's exactly where, where I was too. Like that's what I, growing up, that I thought. Um, I see what I'm doing because I did. If you've seen the first episode, you see that we've utilized. Um, there's a, a pentagram in there. There's um, like uh, candles. There's a, a hoodoo crossroads. Although I've left some stuff out of it, but we're using that uh, symbolism, and I see what we're doing as analogous to what the Christians were doing in putting the face of the green man at the foot of God in their architecture. Um, I'm telling a story that puts, um, that puts that structure together and I'm doing it for it. What's difficult is I'm doing it for two different audiences. I'm doing it for a Christian audience that um, has largely, because we say, don't think, talk, speak about it when it comes to not just like paranormal activity kind of things, like people are having things in their home or experiencing oppression of various sorts. Um, but also when it comes to like uh, actual genuine pastoral issues, um, most churches now, particularly in my own faith tradition in the reform tradition are very functionally material about how they deal with that. Right. It's um, that's a psychological issue almost in like 99 percent. That's going to be psychological. That's going to be chemical imbalance. That's going to require uh, medication. Um, so one audience is is those people. And what I'm doing is in the series for that audience is I'm saying, here's this pattern of evidence, an inductive case that. Uh, maybe there's more going on than just that material analysis. Like that the, the spiritual uh, interacts more with the world that you and I see in time and space than maybe you're accustomed to thinking and to challenge them. That's one audience. And the other audience is uh, basically the pagan audience who is or is close to where Kristen was in practicing this stuff. And to them, I'm building that cathedral and I'm saying what you're, you're serving this lesser God in rebellion against the most high. Um, you're being duped. Uh, and the Christian worldview uh, has explanatory scope and power to make sense of your experience, despite what, you know, your church, the church that you visited and rejected or whatever may have told you that you're crazy. Um, 
the Christian worldview has explanatory scope and power to exp- to account for that and uh, t- turn from your gods and serve the Most High, basically. Yeah. Um, so that's and the the problem with doing that is neither audience is going to be a hundred percent happy with because it's not comfortable for either of them. It's like I've already got feedback on episodes one and two, which are the are the tamest in terms of what's being talked about, I think. Um, but I've already got feedback like where's the, you know, from the Christians, where is the uh, encouragement? How does this, uh, you know? And so anyway, that's... Uh, well, can I say that like even hearing you speak right now and, and talk about these things, like to me, uh, you're like a pioneer in in this in this way. Like it, like it, it's really amazing because I mean, even now, like I feel like we get, you know, we're getting podcasts with Christians, you know, starting talking about these things. Like I love cultish, you know, that's like great stuff. But um, but we don't often see at i don't i've never seen and maybe it's just because i'm not around the genre a whole lot but i've never seen uh a christian nevertheless a reformed christian filmmaker pursue this type of story for the reasons that you just laid out right now and i mean glory to be to god man that's amazing like i i think even even for me and my growth and my faith like the documentary is is helping me process things that I've been thinking about and thinking through of it, it's this sense of like fear God mock evil right like it, coming from this reformed perspective we believe that God is sovereign over all of it and that he's king over all of it and you know I I'm about that post mill now so, so like, not, not, not for my other brothers and sisters to roll their eyes, but even, even like that theological growth that I'm going through there, there's like, you look at the Puritans and everything back in those days, like there really was this sense of like, fear God, mock evil, like God is the one whom I should have the respectful fear for, uh, not these entities that are below him and under his command. So what, what you're doing is art. And it's better yet, it's the true art that's the God glorifying art, because I do believe that's what you're even in two episodes. This is what your story is getting a, across. And once again, I cannot stress to my audience enough that if my wife, <laughs> my if my wife loved this show, like that, it it should go to tell anybody like why you should be watching this, but. All that being said, I, I kind of like, you know, that I feel like that's deep and rich and I'm kind of following it up with maybe a more more silly question. With well, wait, the, hold on. Yeah, hold yeah, up. sure. Uh, on the, I want to, I want to read, I appreciate yeah. the compliment, um, but I want to redirect as much as I can, as much of it. I don't, um, like I've, I've since starting this, right, for the past couple of years, I've read as much as I can. Um, into this stuff. But um, if your audience is interested in it, in like the the worldview that sees this this way, yeah. um, a really good resource is uh, Order of the Sword and Staff. It's a podcast okay. um, done by the pastor that's in my thing. And uh, one of the guys that helped out is like a, he's credited as a consultant on the occult. Um, and he has a background in paranormal investigation that's real deep. And um, and those guys, like, they have a much broader understanding. Um, yeah. And that podcast is is fantastic. So I will, uh, I will, that will be in the link below. I'll drop a link for that below. So anybody watching this, go check that out. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, every, everybody involved in the project, like, you know, especially the pastors and the, I mean, just the people, even, even Kristen, I mean, it's just, it's an, I don't want to give too much away, but it's an incredibly powerful story. So, and I'm sure that you feel really blessed to just even get to be a part of it in that way. But, um, the responsibility of, um, like telling these people's stories is like, it's, 
it is a weight that I feel for sure. And um, it it has tempered all of my decisions about like um, which events and which stories get get put forward has been uh, a calculation and like the last thing that I want to do is to seem like um, we're sensationalizing or like exploiting the thing. It feels so genuine. Like it, it feels honest. And I, I mean, that's one of the number one things I appreciate about it. Well, that's good. That's yeah. That is the intent. So um, it, particularly this area of the world has been, um, has been used as a cheap punchline uh, in pop culture for a long time. And, um, I really didn't want, uh, anyone to get the impression that it was like the paranormal version of Johnny Knoxville's like, uh, whites of West Virginia or whatever that thing is. No. So, um, and that's like, it's a genuine fear, particularly with them too, because they know that, you know, they have been perceived that way. So, um, yeah, I. But at the same time, like this is the area I, like I grew up maybe a half hour, forty minutes north of Logan, um, and so, and I've always like, you, this will probably resonate with you maybe. But uh, growing up, I always wanted to do, um, uh, a film or tell a story. Like even before I knew that I was going to be doing this professionally, like I wanted to tell a story that felt like what West Virginia felt like to me growing up, um, just in mood where like, it's this kind of post-industrial thing. I wanted to, I wanted to ask you my going back to my, my silly question that I wanted to, <laughs> since it's all, I mean, maybe it's not that silly, but, uh, I mean, do you ever, do you ever get scared? Like doing, like doing this type of work? Like, do you, cause I, I, <laughs> after watching the series, I was like putting myself in your shoes or just any of the shoes of the people dealing with it. And, you know, I'm, I'm laying in the bedroom at night, the, like the dark bedroom. And I'm like, I wonder if like war just lays it, like lays there at night sometimes. <laughs> and he was like, oh my gosh, like thinking through like everything he's been editing or that, you know, that he dealt with or saw, like, does he ever just lay there like scared or anything? <laughs> um, no, I will say that like uh, God has been very gracious to me in protecting um, me and my family from a lot of the stuff that I know people close to the case have uh, oh, encountered. Yeah, I will say that there's um, there have been. I mean, I can count on one hand, but one of them was pretty severe. Uh, situation that just like a um, let's see, a you know, mental health situation involving in my family that I think is is probably related. Um, that was the biggest and most significant like thing where I felt like there's been um, attack or pushback or something. Yeah. yeah, I've had a couple of events that are just like weird. Like I was talking. Um, to someone who appears in the documentary on the phone and they mentioned uh, this like numerological synchronicity that pops up from time to time. And when they mentioned it, the number or whatever, like something fell over in the room. And it'd been like a couple weird events like that, but again, like things fall over. So but as far as being scared, like, no, I think one of the, most nights that I work on this, and it was every night for a while, um, before I would sit down to edit it, um, I would pray for, a, like, I don't know how long, but a good chunk of time. For me, who I struggle to have, like, a prayer life at all, it was a good chunk yeah. of time. Um, and then I would sing um, and then work on it. And... Um, for like a fairly buttoned up reformed type that was about as charismatic as I got with uh, like cleansing the house or whatever. But um, 
and it wasn't so much, it was just, I, I was praying to tell the story that, um, that I was given to tell and not get sidetracked by a rabbit hole that I might find interesting or something that would, um, whatever. So, and I, I recognize that I'm walking a tightrope there. So I, I said to say, I haven't felt like scared. Um, there was a, uh, there was a night where I had a really weird, like, I don't get, I've never had panic attacks and I had a weird, like super, super like uh, fight or flight response, like physiological response without any real reason for it. But it wasn't like I was mentally scared. I was just experiencing that. Um, but uh, no, I think I'm the kind of, what I have experienced is like uh recurrence of like old uh temptations that i haven't that you know haven't reared their head in a long time mm, and i think the reason for that is like if i were to see something like you know see a face or a, an apparition or something like that would i think serve as encouragement to me like i would take that as like i'm over the target you know yeah um Whereas this other stuff is like more subtle and more likely to discourage me. I've had like plaguing thoughts of like, I don't think this is good. Like, uh, I'm going to put this out. I think everybody struggles with that. Right. But I mean, I, I'm sure it's on a different like concentration with the type of work that you're doing. Yeah. I, yeah. So there's been that a lot, but, so, like, what would you say to somebody, a filmmaker, a, a Christian filmmaker who, like, might be interested in doing a project like this or just open to doing? Because the way that you explain it, this story developed. It wasn't like you were necessarily seeking this particular story. But what would you say to somebody who is like, you know, I, I think I might be interested in doing a paranormal type documentation series uh, from a Christian worldview, but like maybe they're nervous or hesitant about doing it. Um, what kind of advice would you give to that type of person? Um, it's going to be counterintuitive. <laughs> uh, don't, if you can help it. No. Uh, <laughs> I think you need to go into it with your eyes wide open. And by that, I mean, you need to have a worldview that can account for all of the weird. Um, I would, again, rec uh, recommend Heiser, except for his, he doesn't like Calvinism, but I don't think that he understands it actually. Mm. But um, Heiser, uh, Doug Van Dorn is another guy. Um, he's reformed, reformed Baptist, so, but... Um, the, I would say, so get your worldview straight. You need to be able to account for all of it because whatever you can't account for is probably the thing that, um, will crop up and be like, uh, and be a challenge. So yeah. that would be the first thing. The second thing, um, I would say is you need to be uh, in a church with, um, this is going to be pretty controversial, but you need to be in a church with elders that you can um, submit your work to and that they can have knowledge of and know that you're in this, like working on something like this. Why do you feel that's um, controversial? Well, uh, because a lot of the people that will be interested in doing this are probably in the sort of churches where the ecclesiology does not allow for a real, like a, uh, I see. Yeah. In my experience, you know, yeah. um, but like I have submitted and I plan on continuing to submit both of these, uh, episodes to, um, my elders before they go out. Mm. So, um, not that they're going to agree with my theology of it, yeah. but that um, that they're aware that I'm doing it and that I'm not like doing anything in the name of getting something on camera that's, that's over the line. Yeah. Because the temptation will be, at least in my experience, um, 
there's a temptation toward obsession with this stuff, uh, particularly if you have the kind of mind that like sees patterns and thinks like conspiratorially. Um, you will, if you have that bent toward like paranoia, I guess. Um, the temptation will be to like obsess over getting the next answer, getting the next clue. And that seeking after hidden knowledge is exactly the thing that the enemy will use to get you to do, to get you to cross lines that you would not have thought you would cross. Um, and so that danger is, is very real. If you're the kind of person that's likely to be into doing it, um, that's probably the temptation that's going to arise. And you've got to be aware um, of it and cover the entire thing in uh, prayer, as many people as you can get to pray for you, and, um, and be ready to walk away. Like, that's the, the last thing is, like, be ready to drop it all and walk away from it. Um, there's a reason that uh, paranormal investigation teams, quote unquote, are a dime a dozen and they last like two months usually. Because um, this kind of thing uh, like takes people in and chews them up. And, um, and if it helps, uh, there are never, you're never going to get any like concrete answer. So the hidden knowledge that you're seeking is always a carrot hung out in front of you. So, and that, I mean, that is the Gnostic impulse. In some sense, it is the, like the Luciferian impulse. Um, it's why there's a, like why they depict the Baphomet with a torch on his head, because that's the enlightenment. That's the secret gnosis that you're meant to be chasing the whole time. Um, and that's always the promise is, you know, enlightenment, knowing something that you didn't know before. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that, uh, <laughs> yeah. No, that's great advice. And I feel like, too, that I mean, not even just in the documentary genre, but also just even if you have a narrative film that's dealing with those type of things like in in our project Sage, which is on lore, the uh, I mean, there's like it's dealing with like new age, you know, type philosophy and, you know, Christian worldview versus new age worldview and you know, there's there's demonic activity within that film. So even like what you're saying right now is helpful. Like before we go into production on this thing, like I want to be very weary and mindful of like what we're doing with with just a solid fear of God and, you know, a, a deep understanding of his word and dealing with these subjects. And uh, I mean, especially with like, I feel like this, I, I don't feel like this gets talked about a lot, but I mean, when you're dealing with like actors and stuff too, who are portraying these things, I think that there's like should be a really sobering setting for that as well. So your your advice on that is is helpful to me um, in dealing yeah, with that process. You definitely don't. There's, I think there's ditches on either side of this road, but you don't want to go into recreating a scene in which all of that symbolism is there, as if the symbolism doesn't mean anything. Um, like we deny, of course, you know, it's, it's like Paul talking about the meat sacrificed to idols. Like we deny that the idol in itself bears any power, but you wouldn't want to, um, act as though it meant nothing. I guess. So it's like, so sort of like doing it for the sake of like cheap horror glory, like type of thing. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I guess. Um, or treating it as if you can just throw those symbols around. Um, like I intend on uh, burning all of this stuff after it's used as props. But, <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> good idea. It's, but, you can uh, film it like a nice bonfire. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, But um, I was going to ask you, was there... Uh, so it's kind of a two-part question. Was there a, a moment in your life where it was like sort of a defining moment where you decided you wanted to be a filmmaker and you wanted to pursue this type of work. But then also too, I mean, you you're knowledgeable of like sort of the, the super biblical 
element, the supernatural biblical elements of things? And like, was there sort of like a moment where that hit you as well? And to where like you're combining that with your filmmaking skills um, and take that, take that as you will. I know that's like a three part question now. <laughs> uh, let's see. So the filmmaking thing, um, I intended on being a musician when I was younger. Oh, cool. And I had, um, it's a long story, but I, had, I dropped out of high school and went to a, uh, a tiny, uh, college in upstate New York um, and got employed there on the AV team. And one of the things that we did was make like um, these DVDs that you would sell to the camp kids after the camp. And um, I fell in love with basically, I mean, it was basically a music video. So I fell in love with like uh, bringing uh chaos out of the order and setting it to music um and that's that i was 17 at the time and that's when i was like i think i kind of want to do this and at the same time like um spiritually i was extremely affected by uh the by hosea the account of the minor prophet hosea and uh, I really wanted to, and this has been like an idea in the back of my mind for a long time, is to tell that story. And it's such a, it would be such a challenging thing to do on film that I think that's why it's stuck with me as this like idea for so long. Um, yeah. And yeah, so then the supernatural, I mean, I, uh, after that point, uh, I had a period um, where like my wife and I were pretty much out of church and uh, wrestled with my faith quite a bit um, in my like early 20s. And um, as far as like, I mean, there's two ways that people talk about, like there's supernatural and I never got to the point where I would have denied consciously that the supernatural exists or whatever. Like I was taught that growing up. And, yeah. Um, but it was, I would say, largely irrelevant. Like one of the things that I appreciated about the reform tradition when I came to it was uh, how uh, academic and rational and logical it could be. And that right. was coming out of, like I grew up in pietism and fundamentalism and like um, having objective truth outside of me to anchor my soul was more uh, was really appealing about the, the reform tradition. And so I honestly, up until probably COVID, um, it hadn't really occurred to me as like a thing I needed to think about or study or have an answer to. And I guess, uh, I had started a new job and one of the ladies there was big into, um, some of the, con the conspiracy theory camp that shall not be named. Um, <laughs> And I had a friend that was deep in that too. And um, yeah, so I just trying to like clarify, okay, what do I think about this? And then, yeah, really from there, it is just talking to, talking to Josh that time and that launched this whole thing. And like during the production of it, of course, I'm trying to like read and catch up. I'm trying to read Heiser and um, listen to uh, podcasts and stuff. So so even the project itself really kind of like spurned forth that. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, this is the first time it had ever occurred to me to make something covering this material or in this kind of genre. It, this genre doesn't really exist. Like, no. um, <laughs> it does not. Weird. Which is another reason why it's cool. <laughs> yeah, like, uh, I mean, the closest thing. Um, it's a little bit like some of the stuff that small town monsters does. And mm -hmm. it's a little bit like, uh, just in like subject matter that we're getting into. It's a little bit like hell. You're just, those guys are playing for the other team as it were, yeah. but, um, yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Um, so I had one last question for you. Do you have any 
like vision for the future at all? Like, do you have other projects that you that you hope to? Are, are you looking to explore this genre even more? So, or are you is it dark holler and done? <laughs> Not if I can help it. Uh, <laughs> no, I I have no plans for like dark holler two or okay. season two or whatever. I I don't know what. Um, you know, an, another story may, may drop in my lap. I don't know. Um, and at that point, it'll just, you know, I don't know. Uh, I, I've been doing, I did uh, like some work in the cryptid space, I guess, with um, Tony Merkel. Uh, his brand is called uh, League of Legends that we're trying to kind of build, um, doing sort of, he runs the confessionals podcast, which is a huge podcast in the space. And so he's got all of these stories that people have called in and told him, like, I don't know, he's close to 500 episodes now. And, um, what we've been doing is kind of looking for some of the really like popular or compelling stories and go talk to those people, uh, like put boots on the ground where they are and then do, um, just observing type investigation, see what happens, uh, if we can be in the same sort of place and time that they were and see what, see what we can find. So we've got another one of those. We did one on, uh, this dog man story out of Kentucky and we did this summer. We're going out toward, uh, the Uinta basin, um, and where Skinwalker ranch is. So very cool. That's the uh, that's the extent of it right now. Ward, thank you so much for coming on World Stage Reform today. Where can everybody find you, like socials? And we'll drop a link to to the Dark Holler page for Lore as well. But yeah, yeah. where can we find you otherwise? Uh, so all of the socials are at Dark Holler Film. That's uh, D A R K H O L L E R F I L M. Um, that's Instagram and Facebook. Um, we have a discord if anyone wants to jump in and ask questions or I, I plan on sort of as the investigation piece gets to be more of a component, um, kind of crowdsourcing some of that. I'm yeah. holding back two investigation threads right now until episode three drops. And then, um, if that's your kind of thing, uh, that could be fun. Very cool. Well, thank you so much, Ward. We, we appreciate you coming on. And uh, I'm like I said, I'm very encouraged by Dark Holler. Everybody should go check it out on the link below. And until then, we'll see you all next time. All right. Thanks for having me.